everybody. Welcome to another episode of What a Hell of a Way to Die. It's me and Nate. Uh, we, we've had a couple of weeks of me doing some interviews, and now we're back. Uh, though, if you have missed our banter, uh, we have a couple of dad chats from this month up on the uh, the Patreon at patreon.com. Hell of a way. Nate, how are you doing? How how is How are things over there on the, uh, on the other side of the world? I, uh, I think that, well, today is sunny, so um, it's actually pretty nice, quite frankly. We've had uh, that it's irritating cold hell, thing we, yeah. Where, where it's yeah, where where it's like, oh look, it's so bright and sunny, not a cloud in the sky, it's so nice, and you step outside and it's nine fucking degrees and you wanna die. That's been great. Yeah, I mean it's I went for a run yesterday, it was like completely solid gray, but you know, warm enough that like after about ten minutes I didn't need to I I didn't wear gloves, but I my hands weren't cold anymore, like I warmed up pretty well. And it was actually pretty nice weather for uh, a nice little 5K, which is my first exercise since falling off my bike. So uh, it was nice. It was actually really nice. And, you know, I just got my bike helmet, new bike helmet to replace the one that I damaged when I fell. So uh, I'm excited for, um, you know, getting to ride again. Hopefully the weather stays nice. We'll see. But yeah, I mean, you know, it's another day in Britain. Um, yeah. I, dumb I dumb politics, things are happening. But, uh, but you know, that's, that's any day ending and why. Yeah, during during one of the dad chats, I was going to ask you about what's going on with England, and everybody's just mad that Boris Johnson went to a party, um, like after the king died or something, or the the, the queen's husband died, and you know, it's just it, as soon as I looked into it, I was like, oh, this seems very British and not not anything I need to worry about. So I'll just let the Brits deal with the Brits. Yeah, I mean, it is weird to me that after all of the things that that uh, you know the Tories have done and fucked up over the course of the last you know two plus years that and then never mind the fact that you know the nine years prior they were in power where they were inflicting austerity on this country it is very strange to me that the thing that has cut through is that uh boris johnson and other senior tories broke the rules about gatherings but also i think that's because the media decided that it was a thing and in this country they can they can basically swing the polls however they want to depending on coverage and it's funny to watch but it's also very difficult to stop yourself from becoming cynical because it's just uh it's so meaningless like there won't actually be consequences there's been a lot of really overt fraud and things along those lines um you know with with covid procurement with ppe uh with the test and trace system like which just wasn't functional and cost billions of pounds things along these lines you know the them putting people in discharging patients into care homes so like old folks homes without covid tests Despite or without even alerting the staff that they were COVID positive in the initial couple of months of the pandemic when there was no vaccine and they didn't really know that much about how to treat or mitigate it. You know, at a certain point, like 40% of all care homes in the UK had COVID outbreaks. Something like 40,000 people died in care homes. The government tried to hide those figures in the total COVID death toll. Uh, They basically were trying to argue that you could only be counted if you died in the hospital and not in a care home with a positive COVID test. So if you died uh, before your test came back positive, you wouldn't count, things like that. So, I mean, like I could go on forever about this stuff, but basically lots of fraud, stupidity, mismanagement, incompetence, et cetera. And it is wild because the one thing that has managed to really put a, some damage on them has been this. But Boris Johnson, if he doesn't want to resign, they're not going to be able to force him to. And so we'll see what happens. Supposedly there's a, there's a report coming out uh, into their, you know, wrongdoing and whatnot we'll see what happens but uh it's it's just a reminder that i mean when they started talking about these parties all of these journalists started being like oh yeah here's this information here's this invite i got here are these tips here are these photos etc from 2020 or early 2021 and it's like you guys had this information for almost two years and you just fucking sat on it and it's like yeah because they're all the same <laughs> class and they go to the same racism parties together and like you know it's that's how the system works here. And it's just, it's just, they have, they feel less obligated to hide it than they do in America. We'll put it that way. I, I often wonder what it's like to be one of those people that like is very hopeful that, uh, you know, that, that consequences will happen to these people. Like the, the, just looking at the 3000 plus people who still subscribe to the Mueller, she wrote podcast, um, which I don't think actually puts out podcasts anymore. Uh, no, it's the Daily Beans now. Uh, so they, they found a way to keep their, yeah, almost 4,000 people going. You know, I just, 
I, I, it's always the, it's always the weirdest things that bring people down in America. Like if you can do anything you want, but as soon as like you try to fuck a 15 year old, you're done. And that's the only thing in America that will bring down a politician. And even that is, is kind of questionable because Matt Gates uh, was apparently hiring underage prostitutes and everybody's just like, ah, oh, I mean, they weren't that underage. Like I, it's still sex trafficking guys, but you know, they're cool with that. You know, as long as it's their people doing the sex trafficking, as long as there's not a comet pizza to go into and start firing rounds off into, uh, the, they're, they're fine with it. So that was actually, that's actually a similar, a similar situation here where, uh, there was a labor MP from, I think Blackpool, uh, city in the, the Northwest. And uh, he was a huge Corbyn critic when Corbyn became the l- labor leader in 2015. And he eventually had to resign because he had, if I'm not mistaken, been like pretty aggressively hitting on and sexting uh, like a 16 or 17 year old volunteer. Uh, now, in Britain, the age of consent is 16, but there is a it's rule. It's still gross. Yeah, and there's a rule that basically if you are in a position of influence or authority over that young person, the, you, they cannot consent to sex with you until they're 18. Now, obviously, you being an MP and them being a volunteer absolutely meets that that requirement that like it's illegal. So he had to resign when the stuff leaked. But if you his name was Simon Danchuk, and if you mentioned him for a while, at least, if you mentioned him and mentioned this allegation, there was this one account... Maybe it was his alt. I don't know. But it would like name search for Simon Danchuk and it would jump in and be like, actually, it's not illegal. The age of consent is 16. Like, you're like, <laughs> yeah, but but what you did is creepy and fucked up. And like, you know, it, it's it, it's absolutely socially taboo, even if you technically didn't do anything that would get you sent to jail. Yeah, it's very um it's very telling when you have to say technically what I'm doing is not illegal. Yeah. Um, that should, that should immediately earn you a spot in a catapult flinging you into the ocean. It's like, it's like in New York state, the age of consent is 17, just like flat out across the board. So Woody Allen's character in the film Manhattan being in his early forties and dating a 17 year old high school senior, that's not illegal, but it's weird. And I'm pretty sure people thought it was weird when the movie came out in like 1979. And now, given all the other stuff in Woody Allen's private life, it seems even weirder. But it was portrayed as sort of like a, hey, this is, you know, the sort of like uh, almost auto fiction style character in a film. And uh, yeah, he very, it's just sort of very casual, like, oh, yeah, <laughs> dating a high school senior and I'm in my 40s. Ugh. And it's just so, like, like, yeah, it's uh, like. I I just that whole that whole phenomenon, man. Like it's just it's just it it makes the age your... the age gap thing. Like for me, it, and this is you know personally, I'm sure everybody will have different opinions on it. But like, I no longer think the age gap gross um, difference is gross as long as everybody is over the age of thirty. Like once <laughs> you hit that, because like you're at a th- at thirty years old, you should know you should you know you're through your twenties. You should understand what's going on. You should have every. Now I'm not gonna say you got everything figured out, but I mean you should not be easily groomed by a by a like sixty year old or something. Um, you know, so it's if if you're if you're like sixty and you're dating a thirty year old, that's fine. But if you're like forty and you're dating an eighteen year old, that's fucking gross. Don't do that. Yeah, man. Anyway, it's, enough it, enough about uh, libertarians. <laughs> it's one of the it's one of those things where, um, yeah, you like that. I, I feel as though so much of this stuff gets thrown around, and you know, I remember years ago interviewing somebody for a business thing where he kind of went off script and was talking about like, I don't think PizzaGate is real, but I do think that there's like, you know, international pedophile conspiracy stuff. And I thought, I was like, God, this guy's insane. Like, what the fuck? This was in 2017. Um, And then all the stuff with the Lolita Lolita Express and Epstein and all the connections and all the stuff came out. And like, I think that stuff was hiding in plain sight in a lot of ways, but it sounded so deranged. It sounded like the guy shooting up Comet Pizza when someone said that to me and I was like, that's fucked up. But then you realize you're like, yeah, this has been treated as kind of like, my perception is that certainly in Britain, and elsewhere in America, uh, and elsewhere in like the the sort of you know the the parts of the world that send people to the World Economic Forum at Davos, uh, it, it 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 seems as though uh, older men with money trafficking you know teens like early like early to late teenage girls 
was basically just treated as sort of like, oh yeah, guys do that. Like they, they whatever that, 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 you know, if you've got money, that's legal. Nobody was incorrect about an, a, uh, a gross international pedophilia ring run by um, the world elite. Like 100% that happens. It's just well, the, the way that you're thinking of, hey, I don't know. I don't know how in tune um, you are to Facebook. I get Facebook updates from my wife who still uh, has to deal with it for, for various reasons. But, you know, there, there's just all this, you know, concern about, you know, uh, white women scared that like their kids are going to get kidnapped and trafficked at a Walmart. Like, no, but that does happen. It's just not to suburban yeah. white kids. It happens to like marginalized and abused and, you know, kids that live on the fringes that are easy to snap up and do these things to your lily white child that just got out of the SUV and is headed to dance class after this is probably not going to get trafficked so it's like you're correct but in a right it's like you're correct but in a wrong way and if they are going to get abused it's most likely not always but most likely going to be either a family member or a friend of the family yeah it's going to be somebody they know somebody they know you know somebody that 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 has worked their way into your trust like it's it's a fucked up situation but like and it's it's one of these conversations where it's really hard to, to have because people's fears are obviously like really acute and vivid and stuff like that and you don't want uh you don't want to sound like you're being a shithead you're like like law parents being worried about their children but like in retrospect, the thought that, you know, if you send your kids to daycare, they're going to get turned into Satanists, which people actually believed in the 80s, it has been proven to be completely insane. And similarly, like, yeah, I think that this this elides the important issue, which is that, like, as long as the victims are seen as marginalized, like, basically everyone looks the other way. And that's 100% the case here. I mean, that's been a huge driver of, of crazy right wing politics in the UK is the fact that, like, that's been a problem here for forever. I mean, go figure with all those stories with Prince Andrew and this stuff dating back to time immemorial. It's sort of like this country has always had issues with uh, people in you know positions of authority and prestige and upper class echelons basically being allowed to get away with abusing, uh, you know, abusing people of lower orders in, in every capacity. I'm sorry, are you telling me that England has a long history of abusing people that it has power over. Weird. That's very <laughs> yeah. strange. But I mean, I think the, the degree of openness in terms of what it used to be like, you know, you read about, I want to say it was Margaret Thatcher's chief of staff, uh, or s maybe it was Major, the, the, the John Major, the prime minister who followed Margaret Thatcher. Um, but I don't remember the name, but I remember that it was like a one of the, the the key figures in their cabinet was keeping a journal of his time when they were in government. And that journal was published, you know, decades later after he died. And he was very, very frank about the fact that like, apparently one of the senior Tory figures or something like, you know, abused boys at some, uh, some uh, like care homes or something like that. And people were like, oh, but he's really discreet about it. And this person was like, well, I, I would fucking hope so. But like, that was the level but, but of- But also, <laughs> don't abuse boys. And I mean, there was a, there was a liberal party um, lord who, after he died, it was like on the order of Jimmy Savile, was discovered to have done this all over the uh, Rochdale. His name was Cyril Smith, and he weighed like five hundred pounds. Like it was a really it, just a just an obscene story. Um, and then similarly, you had the whole like right wing glow eyes chuds on Twitter will always talk about Rotherham, which is a, a town in I, I don't know exactly where in the north of England, but. Um, where there was this organized gang um, exploiting young girls, basically. Um, it, it was mostly, as I understand it, uh, South Asian cab drivers, basically, driving girls around to be sex trafficked. But there had been reports to the police before, and they basically were like, we don't care about these poor white sluts, basically. Like, that's a really vulgar way of phrasing it. But that, that was more or less the attitude the police took. And then, of course, the, the, the right-wing fascists have turned around and been like, um, actually liberalism did this because they were afraid of feeling racist, you know, like by pro prosecuting South Asian guys. But then like there have been plenty of instances of grooming gangs doing the exact same thing where it was all white people. Like if you look at Belgium, for example, there's a whole fucking story behind that where it was like the entire country practically. Um, so I mean, long, long point being made here, but like this stuff has been out there for forever and it's wild to me how much it hasn't really cut through in discrediting politicians who were adjacent to this, who knew about this. Um, but then you look at this stuff, you know, similarly with COVID, nothing really cut through, but apparently attending a party did. And that's where you're like, okay, all right, man, not my country. I live here, you know, I work here, I pay taxes here, but I don't fucking understand this place. At, at, at a certain point in time, you have to just be like, not my, not my culture.
Um, whatever, not. whatever British, whatever British culture is going. Like, look, American culture is fucked up enough. I don't need to be bringing in anybody else's. Oh, hundred percent, man. Hundred percent. Yeah. All right. Well, 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 Nate, do you want to jump into uh, today's military themed discussion? Sure. Um, and and quick note for those of you hoping uh, that we're going to do a deep dive into Russia and Ukraine, uh, we are not, and uh, we probably never will. Um, so yeah, I mean, it. our take on it is basically like until something changes, all you can do is just like I personally feel support whoever is trying to stop there being a conflict. Um, but I don't want to see violence between nuclear armed states. I don't want to see another war in Europe. Uh, I would really like to not see that at all. So ultimately, war yeah, war, war is bad. And, and I think that there's a lot of people who make a lot of bones, you know, yelling and screaming and prognosticating about this stuff. And, you know, I don't have a dog in this fight, but also I, I feel as though the, the, the only sort of principled position in my opinion that one can take is that, you know, anything to diffuse whatever conflict is being ginned up in order to prevent there being a war in Europe, uh, because war is bad in general. And you have, you have, you know, a nuclear armed country, you have NATO with lots of nuclear armed countries. Uh, you have, a situation that could get a lot worse that could really spiral and a lot of really really stupid politicians across the board and you know two armies both in ukraine and in russia that rely on conscripts so people forced into you know military service it's it's a bad situation and i don't want to see it turn into you know a, a full-scale conflict or any kind of shooting war like i just don't so that's my take i think francis you pretty, are, I'm, I'm pretty much on the same thing. Thankfully, yeah. we do not do not make our bones having uh, bad opinions about uh, conflicts that don't involve us. We make our bones by talking about who the island boys are. Um, that is true. <laughs> who are the island boys and why do U.S. troops keep paying them for military shout outs? Uh, and then the uh, quote underneath it, shout out to the free world. Uh, Nate, have you been aware of the island boys before this was brought to our attention? Yes. Okay. Because I, I did not. So please tell me about them. All right. They are two brothers in Florida. Uh, I think they're twins. They're like 20 years old. They're covered head to toe in tattoos, like full, you know, diving suit tattoos, hand tattoos, face tattoos. They have hair that looks like Sideshow Bob. Uh, and they do vi cameo videos where basically you pay them to. Uh, to do shout outs and they 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 sing these shout outs um and i think because they're ridiculous looking uh they have achieved a certain degree of cachet where you know people are paying them a couple hundred bucks to do shout out videos uh and i think the f this has become a thing in the military to hire them um but i think the thing that's the funniest one this crossed my feed maybe last week was that they had received a commission to sing a song to appeal to the Marines to not kick out a guy named Staff Sergeant Vasquez for a DUI because uh, he's an island boy. and uh, <laughs> Honorary island boy. Honorary island boy. They, which they like, sing, makes me obviously. Want, like, first off, these two are not even old enough to drink and drive, so what the fuck are you guys talking about? But, uh, you know, and we get to, we get to learn, uh, in this article from task and purpose, how to become an uh, honorary Island boy. I don't know if we need to pay money or if we need to, to, uh, almost get kicked out of the military for drunk driving. It seems like it's not hard to become an Island boy. Um, yeah, I don't have enough, I don't have enough tattoos or enough hair though. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I think one of the things that gets me about it is it, it's, it's weird to see, you know, military humor military social media stuff in my experience always gets like super weird it's either like hyper niche stuff that's just completely impenetrable to anyone who's not in the military or it's like really you know grunt style you know shoot him in the face shit that like a lot of times is being enthusiastically shared by you know people's memos and cops um, there was there was a beautiful time during uh the last 20 years conflicts where like for four or five years, the only thing that you saw military like soldiers overseas doing, like when they would upload stupid videos, it was them doing their own music videos. And it was fun. And it was kind of like it was at, at times. And I remember um, I was there when the Kesha video came out, which is one of my favorite ones, which is the blah, blah, blah one, which came out right after uh, Don't Ask, Don't Tell was repealed. 
And so the whole thing is just like they're letting gays in the military. And so the entire music video is very like, you know, it's 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 very homoerotic and it's very fun and very funny. And I remember I was in Iraq when it came out and command about shit a brick because uh, they found out it was filmed on Cobb Adder while we were there. Um, so they were not too happy about it. I don't think anybody really got punished, though, because like it was very popular uh, and it made people it, it made people like like the military like at that time was was really searching for a win of any kind. So like when that came out and people were like, "Hey, this is not offensive and it's actually kind of funny," then uh, they're like, "Well, shit! Now we, now what do we do?" Um, so this is different though. Uh, cameo, and I haven't I haven't paid for a cameo. The really the only um, uh, the only cameo experience I have is uh, a couple years ago when Mill Twitter bought uh, a shout out from Tommy Loren. To a guy who is in uh, Afghanistan, Tom, uh, who does not like Tommy Loren whatsoever. Uh, so that was, you know, kind of a trolling thing. But this is this is different. These guys seem like uh, I don't I don't know if it's one of those like laughing. They're not laughing with you. They're laughing at you. But uh, you know, I I I always appreciate entrepreneurship, uh, especially from two dudes that um, look like whatever this is. I feel like I'm I feel like I'm I'm sounding too old when I talk about this, but I also feel like if I was 20 years old, I'd think this is fucking stupid too. At least I hope I would think that. Yeah, well, the thing that I would say here is that uh I obviously find it funny, but also agree when people say like ultimately you're giving people money, so if they're pieces of shit, like you don't want to be doing that even if it's a funny yeah. joke. Yep. I've seen people do it to, you know, the thinking that they've owned Nigel Farage by paying him to do a cameo video where he says like up the raw or something like that but you're still giving money to fucking Nigel Farage so come on man uh, yeah, if you're gonna if you're gonna own me have Gilbert Godfrey call me like names or something like pay, give Gilbert Godfrey money to insult me for 30 30 seconds and then that's money well spent and also I'm just not you know because I like Gilbert Godfrey you can give him money that's fine yeah I think, I think he th does cameos I think the 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 situation that we have here is that at the end of the day, you're seeing some of this stuff bl like kind of blur or, or, or merge like stuff that would be military niche things are on the same platforms in ways they weren't before. So as you get to the point where you can share stuff on, on you know, TikTok, you know, all these apps, et cetera, you know, Facebook video became a thing. It wasn't before, you know, uh, at one point Twitter did more video. It doesn't really that much anymore. You know, the advent of, of, of these more and more sort of like stream your life kinds of technologies, uh, the military is going to have a part of that. Like people are people who are in the military are going to be doing it. And, you know, you're going to see that, you know, morons completely nuke their careers by by being stupid online. Like that guy who decided to make like anti-Semitic Pokemon jokes, who was a second <laughs> lieutenant. Um, which is just the it's, fact that I have to say that out loud, man. What the it fuck fucking, it fucking I'm kills me every time. Like every time something comes out with military, like some troops do some video, and it looks like they're having fun, and you see a bunch of people be like, "That's obviously a CIA op, or that's obviously some sort of recruiting thing that they're doing." Like, th there's no, there's no chance that a soldier is doing just like normal people stuff. But as soon as somebody is just like super anti-Semitic, it's just like, "Oh no, that's that soldier." It's like, oh, what, what happened to CIA ops, man? I thought we were all CIA ops, like. Can can you can you just understand that soldiers can be fun and cool, but also kind of dickheads at the same time? Like it's it's fine. We don't have to we don't have to make a, a big thing out I mean, of this. It's just like a group of any other fucking you know eighteen to twenty two year olds by and large. Like the army, that was one of the things that always surprised me. Like when I first went to Benning for airborne school when I was twenty years old, and you know you live in the barracks like everybody else. It's 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 not, you're not you're not an officer yet, so you're not getting any officer privileges for damn sure. And I think it's a good experience to have that. Since, yeah. you know, we're not required to go to basic the way that enlisted soldiers are like our basic is very different. So and nothing, and nothing wrong with uh, living in a large room with uh, 50 to 60 of your closest. Yeah, friends. I mean, obviously, like, OK, I when I was in ROTC, we trained uh, at Atterbury. So like we were in big open bays and then obviously in, in places like Ranger School, SFAS, et cetera, I was in big open bays. And obviously, like when you deploy or when you're, you know, at NTC or you're on you know, field exercises, it's not a whole lot of privacy either. So like, yeah, in the grand scheme of things, you know, you do get that experience somewhat, but like early on, it's, you know, good to, I think, have that experience uh, where you, 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 you are treated like a soul, like just the same as every other soldier. So, you know, you're in the same barracks, you're in the same formations, you're in the same chow line, you're doing all the shit you're supposed to do. And I remember thinking like, this is basically just like shitty college. 
Like we live in dorms. We have a dining facility. Uh, we, we can, we but have you free get time. paid instead of going into debt. Yes. Yes. That's true. But like the stuff that happens, clicks that form among people, you know, people doing secret shady shit, like all this stuff, that's all a hundred percent like being in college. So, so I kind of want to read through this article because it got, it gets kind of weird, but also there's a, uh, there's, there's a very, there's a very good PAO like moment in, in this article that I absolutely love, uh, that we'll get to. Uh, so this is on task and purpose by David Rosa. Uh, you can't get more out of regs than the Island boys, the 20 year old Florida twins who sport tattoos on their faces, spiky hairdos that will never fit under a helmet and seem allergic to wearing shirts. But for reasons only the internet can understand service members are paying them to send holiday greetings to airmen abroad, give shout outs to star soldiers, or even protest the military justice system. Uh, quote, do not kick Sergeant Vesque- Vasquez out because he's an island boy, they sang in one shout out, post, uh, shout out posted last week. Oh, I know he got his DUI, but give him a second chance. There's always room for a second chance. Uh, and if you, if you, you know, watch these videos and listen to these, uh, these cameos, it's, they're just kind of like, I don't know if they have like an auto tune thing set up somewhere. Cause that's all it is. Yeah, is yeah, them yeah, just yeah, singing yeah. It's, the it's, thing and it's just a lot of auto tuning. Uh, it was not clear which branch of service Sergeant, uh, Sergeant Vasquez is in, but Barstool Sports reported he's a Marine. Quote, he does positive stuff, so I don't, uh, uh, sorry. Quote, he just does positive stuff, so I know he's going to make it to the top. The Island Boys continue. Don't kick him out because you're going to regret it. You're going to miss him. Um, there's a very, very good chance that Sergeant Vasquez is a huge dick. Uh, and, and that's not like... I, I, I am just making an assumption uh, based on uh, a sergeant of Marines who has a DWI. The Island Boy duo, uh, Kodiak Red, real name Fred Vengus, and Fly Soldier, Alex Vengus, blew up on TikTok last year for their poolside song, I'm an Island Boy, which got dunked on by much of the internet. And see, I missed out on that one. That one didn't come across. This is the problem with being like nearly 40 on Twitter. Like these things don't come across you. It's all on TikTok. And I don't like watching videos. Um, Let's see. Two goofballs in the pool, said the rapper Snoop Dogg after chuckling through the song with comedian Kevin Hart. Nowadays, the Island Boys sing for clients on Cameo, a a service which pays... Which users pay anywhere from $135 to $600 or more for personalized shoutouts. The t- twins seem to be delivering. 336 reviewers left them an average rating of 4.9 out of 5 stars. Service members were not afraid to get in on the action. Uh, so this one is a big shout out to the world famous Rocketeers. You guys are the F-15 E fighter jet squadron <laughs> away from the holidays. Shout out to the free world. Uh, they said in a December cameo. The Rocketeers is a nickname for the 336 Fighter Squadron based in Seymour Johnson Air Force Base, North Carolina. At the time, several of the Rocketeers were far from home, flying training exercises from Royal Air Force Station, uh, Lake and Health in the United Kingdom. Y'all, the world-famous Rocketeers to the top. Y'all go in the fighter jets and really take off, the Island Boys sang in their shout-out. Though it was unclear who requested the cameo, it definitely drew the attention of military viewers. Uh, let's see. So at, at, at the, so there's a couple of, you know, quotes from people who are just talking about it, but then at the time, the fourth fighter wing, which oversees the 332nd fighter squadron did not say whether or not it had been involved in the song's creation. Um, and this is, this is a perfect, this is such a PAO thing because like they get asked a question about this fucking ridiculous, like these, these, these dipshits and somebody who paid these dipshits to sing a song about how great the fighter squadron is. And the quote that we get after task and purpose goes to them uh, from uh, their wing commander is quote, the fourth fighter wing couldn't be more proud of the hard work and dedication of the men and women of the 336 FS and FGS. The wing commander, Colonel uh, Kurt Helpenstein told task and purpose. The Rocketeers have been working nonstop during this holiday season away from their families and their selflessness is a reminder that our mission to defend the nation never stops. So, at no point in time mentioning anything that was asked of them. This is, this is the most perfect command message I've ever seen in my entire life. And it is, it, it, I feel like this is how like, you know, higher up officers really do need to, because this is going to be a thing going on, not necessarily with the Island boys, but with just like troops doing dumb things. And then somebody calling a Colonel and saying, Hey, how about this troop doing this dumb thing? And the Colonel just being like, look, we're very proud of our soldiers for doing their soldier shit. It's very nice. Look at them. Look at how nice they're being. Please stop calling me. Yeah, there's an extent to which I, I I do admire the hustle. Uh I hope these guys aren't problematic. I mean they're they're 
there are 20 year olds with face tats in Florida who seem a little bit off their rockers. So I'm hoping there's no problematic decision making going on, but you never know. But I just, I do find it very funny how, you know, like, do you remember Riff Raff, the rapper Riff Raff? Yes. Like if, if yes, it, I maybe do. Riff Raff does cameos, but especially after James Franco starred in Spring Breakers, like if you could have done cameos for Riff Raff, I'm sure so many dudes in the military would have done that just to like get laughs. Uh, I'm amazed. Honestly, I feel like Riff Raff is probably like if he if he still got, you know, uh, the, the ridiculous hair and the ridiculous teeth and the gigantic Bart Simpson necklace, maybe he uh, he should get on cameo if he's not already because I feel like he could make a killing. But like if this had happened during his moment, then it would have been even more insane. And it's just one of those things where it's like, you know, troops grew up on the internet because troops are by and large dudes under 25 and obviously there's a significant proportion of them who are who are uh not cis men but like by and large especially in combat arms it's a pretty big chunk of your of your group they're young dudes and you know if you grew up on the internet like you're gonna see the same stuff you're gonna be on so probably on social media probably all your civilian friends are on it too you're gonna see this stuff shared you know and people are it's not as like hermetically sealed as it used to be and so this stuff's going to bleed over in weird ways and we're going to see things like this. Um, do you remember some of the like viral songs that would get passed around in the military? Like we're talking like pre, pre YouTube even, or like early YouTube, I like remember, I'm a Fobbit or. I, I remember uh, uh, Crazy, Crazy Ramadi. Ramadi. Yeah, I was going to say. That was 2006. Yeah, like yeah. the guys making their own videos because like one soldier knows how to use, you know, Adobe Pegasus or whatever. Uh, and like they're filming it. <laughs> somebody, on their- somebody managed to get it installed on their on their tough book and they're uh, feverishly working away with like uh, a camera that sh- shoots only in 480p. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, the, like, like a digital camera, like Sony digital camera that, sh- you know, records video and photos to mini disc for some reason. And, you know, they're recording this stuff and uh, yeah, guys got like iMovie or whatever. And like there were these things being shared around, you know, stupid, like viral intra military things uh, that would be getting shared. And the only way to get them was, you know, either it got hosted on uh, College Humor or um, Newgrounds or like someone emailed it to you or it got passed around like on a USB stick. So to me, this is just that phenomenon. Like that was already happening decades ago. It's just been accelerated by the fact that it's now so much easier to share things. And it's, it's weird to yes, see that much, culture collide. It's much more accessible. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm never a person that's going to be anti-technology. I think like all the streaming platforms are way better than what we used to have. Because like when you went to Blockbuster, it's like, here's, here's your choices. Um, there's no other choices that you have other than these like, you know, 250 movies uh, or whatever, which, you know, kind of sucks after a while. So I'm, I'm all about this. I'm all about, uh, you know, soldiers. I, I, I want, I want everybody to to feel like they can be themselves on the internet um because one it shows that sometimes people can have a lot of fun and two it helps us weed out the really racist people who haven't figured out to shut their fucking mouths so that we can you know effectively i don't know cancel them or whatever kick them out of the military if we need to um this one though like it takes it takes a kind of a weird uh a, a, a weird turn though because like now like a recruiter paid them money to uh to to you know join the army So uh, every few days, the twins posted a big shout out to a staff sergeant who works in army recruiting and is, quote, changing lives. He's giving out 50K, said Fly Soldier in the cameo. Woo, 50K, said Kodiak Red. Army recruiter giving out bonuses, paid vacation, and free college no money, said Fly Soldier. Which is, uh, you know, yes, there are are big uh, pushes for recruits because, you know... uh, the, because once again, the account, you can get a job um, and it doesn't have to be the military. So nobody wants to join the military. The only time people join the army is when there's no good jobs anymore. So uh, and also everybody has COVID now. So nobody, you know, it's it's very difficult for the army recruiters to do their their thing. But uh, apparently these guys have no problem being army recruiters, which like I get. But like an army recruiter probably gets paid more than whatever these guys got for their uh, for their cameo shout out. They got like. 7.1 million followers on TikTok. Uh, they're doing some marketing for for army recruiting, but uh, 
I feel like they should be getting a little bit more money if they're going to be putting well, themselves out yeah, I mean, like, like if that. You, if, if you get $500 from doing a cameo, you know, how much money did the army spend on the whole Army Strong campaign? Wasn't it on the order of like billions of dollars over the lifetime of the campaign? Dude, the army pays pays um, football stadiums to allow them to go and do like all those all those salute the troop things. The army pays oh, yeah, for yeah, those. Yeah. That's paid for by tax dollars. That's, Absolutely, you know, yeah, yeah. I know, that I know that. Shit. But I'm just, I, I just find it funny yeah. that yeah, like you're saying, you know, like, like you're saying, if if this person is using this to achieve their recruiting mission, these guys should charge a hell of a lot more. Yes. I am I am here for the I am here for the island boys to uh get their bag properly. Um because if there because if there's one thing that I 100% support, it's um the little guy bilking the government out of a couple of bucks, you know. Uh let's see, the army staff sergeant is an island boy said Kodiak Red because he's quote helping people right now. He's doing a good the good positive things. He's a real honorary island boy. Uh, that is going to be a strange bullet point on somebody's NCOER. Yeah, um, I mean, there's 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 part of me that's like, guys, do this and get get the money, but just be be cautious of becoming a military niche thing. You don't want to go the route of being three doors down. I don't know. They could. Well, yeah, I don't. I don't think that. Uh, well, I don't. Yeah, look, we've always said that uh, conservatism is where the the real money's at. But I think these guys are. I, I hopefully the Island Boys will. Um, keep themselves uh, just a cameo and doing weird shout outs for the military. I'm um, surprised more people haven't jumped in, but after this, uh, this report, maybe they will, maybe they're really going to blow up kind of like the, uh, the gal who had the only fans and the official Fort hood uh, Twitter account was being horny at her. Um, apparently she like quadrupled her only fans. Oh, I think it that, was so. Fort Bragg, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Bragg, the guy, yeah. the guy who was the, the manager who was, whoever was in charge of running the Fort Bragg, uh, you know, Imcom account forgot to log out of that account before just, just being thirsty down bad in the replies of a, a woman <laughs> who was sort of like promoing only fans material. And yeah, there was a report about that story. I think that yeah, she she went from making like uh, I think seven or eight thousand dollars a month to like thirty thousand dollars a month on on OnlyFans yeah. after the publicity from from this guy being just just down terrible. Um, which I mean, how to describe this? I respect her for monetizing that situation and 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 getting paid. And everything else is just that fin- very familiar feeling that I feel like is universal in the military, where as long as someone's fuck up isn't harming or inconveniencing you, it's just happening to someone else and they have to deal with it. It's hilarious. It's fucking yes. hilarious. Now, if it does harm you or your your guys, or if it does inconvenience you, like it's not funny when a unit loses a pair of nods or like an encryption device because then everyone's locked down and everyone's days ruined. It's not funny when someone does something so dangerous, like it hurts them or their soldiers or like threatens you or threatens your mission, that kind of a thing. Like, or suddenly every, everybody's on like a weekend restriction because some dumbass on a Thursday decided to go, you know, drunk driving around. Like if a guy negligent discharges a Mark 19 into a HESCO barrier and people are hurt or killed, it's horrible. It's absolutely horrible. If it happens and no one's hurt, it's fucking hilarious. I mean, obviously they get punished as, yes. as long as it's not your unit. It's hilarious. It's 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 like it's the one of the funniest things that could possibly happen for civilian listeners who aren't aware of this. Uh, I don't know it well enough to speak authoritatively, even though at one point I did. But the way the automatic grenade launcher, the Mark 19, works requires you to to load it. Requires you to basically go through the motion of loading. Uh, what feels like loading a route into the chamber, charge it, fire it, then charge it again because you you dry fire it to basically advance the the, the belt, if I remember correctly, and I might be wrong, uh, to get a, a grenade loaded into the chamber so you can then fire it. Um, this creates a situation where soldiers become familiar with the se- love sensation of like, oh yeah, I run through my, my process for loading it, which is, you know, charge it, fire it, charge it again. And invariably this happens if people aren't really paying attention or being monitored, if they're not familiar with the weapon system, that they're like, oh, point it in the safe direction, run through the whole process, and don't remember they have a round in the chamber after having already done this and fire a round. Uh, and this has happened so many times. It's obviously insanely dangerous because it's a 40 millimeter grenade. But like I said, if no one's hurt, no one's killed, and if it's not your unit, 
it's hilarious like when a soldier from my battalion uh showed up brand new like 18 year old private and then went out got drunk and passed out in a snowdrift got rescued by the other battalion uh their their uh, battalion staff duty guy and then threw up in the staff duty nco's car that wasn't funny for us because it was our soldiers so we had to deal with the problem <laughs> if it had been another battalion like two other battalions it would have been hilarious like that's the general rule but also it's kind of it's funny now that it's also over yeah now that it's over it's also funny one time my uh my old company the commander's radio guy uh left a small key loader on the pickup zone on the middle of a mountain in afghanistan and realized it midway through their flight back to their base so he told the commander and the commander was like ah fuck okay and he just got on he he, he I, I guess talked to the crew chief and through that talked to the pilots and technically it was their airs so the commander could do what he wanted and he was like turn the fuck around and fly us right back to that pz and they landed and <laughs> did a little scan of the pz and the skl was there and so they were able to pick it up now for, for those of you who don't know this skl is basically like I, maybe they're still around i don't know back in those days they are uh like a palm pilot style big ruggedized device that contains all of the cryptographic fills that you would need to load onto radios that use uh you know communications cryptography um when you're out on missions typically you're talking with uh you know like encoded radios so they're scrambled um and if you lose one of those every single radio in theater has to be reset every single radio in like in Kuwait, in Qatar, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Bahrain, in Kyrgyzstan, everyone in CENTCOM is going to have to get an emergency crypto reload. And like, you will get fucking obliterated for this. So like, <laughs> in the end, this RTO got an article 15 for this, but like a company grade. Um, so he got punished, but like, it was at the local level. They solved the problem. Right. He got... It Right. It's it's one of those it's like, look, you didn't you didn't fuck every you didn't fuck everybody, but also I can't just let you get away with this. Yeah. So you're on restriction. But had they for come back weeks. and that thing had been gone or they couldn't find it, like the commander might have gotten relieved level of bad. Like Yeah. It, it it is. Just, that's when that's when that's when you say, Are you throwing yourself off the cliff or am yeah, I throwing like, you off the cliff? It, it, it was like that's like a nuclear grade bad problem. And so yeah, you know, um in retrospect, very funny but wouldn't have been funny if it had ended a different way and wasn't funny at the time. So yeah, once again, you know, much like uh m- much like these situations I I've laid out here, I find the situation with the horny uh guy who's supposed to be running the Fort Bragg account absolutely hilarious. And I feel like anyone who wasn't in the direct, you know, raiding chain of that person also found it hilarious. It's just that, you know, we never, we never found out who it was and I never want to know. It doesn't matter. No, we did. We did find out who it was. It was a DA civilian, uh, who was in charge of the account. Yeah. Oh no. Yeah. So he's probably even more expendable. What happens when you contract out to KBR? Exactly. PAO would know better than this. Salty fucking three times divorced Mm. staff sergeant would know better than this. Hopefully. Mm, well, Maybe. yeah, because he would have his own device that he's horny on <laughs> and not be a horny on the military device. <laughs> yeah, getting, getting horny on the fucking 2011 era BlackBerry that you ha- you're you required to post on. It's like a, a you know, exactly. a, a, an accountable item when you sign up for the PO shop. Oh, man, I don't miss that at all. I don't miss, you know, it's weird, like talking about this stuff and getting punished for DUIs and mass punishment and things like that. I don't miss any of it because... I recall so many ruined weekends where we got dragged in for dumb bullshit because someone else had gotten it, someone in the company or the battalion or the fucking brigade had gotten a DUI. And so we were getting mass punished for it. Uh, I don't know if I ever, if I ever told you the story about my, <laughs> God, about my first day back from Afghanistan. Well, not first day, but okay. When you went through deployment cycle support on the way back for my brigade, you showed up. And if I remember correctly, We got in and then our first hard time was like in the classroom on base or on post at like 3 p.m. the day after we got back. So we got back at like 11 p.m. or midnight and then we had to be somewhere at 3 p.m. on post for deployment cycle support. And it was like medical, physical, mental health, PAO, all that that shit. Just like go through a bunch of classrooms in the basement and get checked off, do all these things, you know, et cetera. Get like a TB screening, you know, et cetera, et cetera. All this stuff. Just like so it it was four days of DCS. And then we had a four day weekend. 
So we got done. We finished DCS at like one or two p.m. and then like we had the like it. It wasn't like a like an actual weekend. It was just the middle of the week, but we had a four day because like it was our you know we had just come back from deployment, and we my my chalk was the last thing smoking on the brigade. Like had we had we missed that flight, had you had to stay for some other reason, you would have had to have flown like theater shit, you know, to Kuwait and then to Germany or to New York or whatever or to Atlanta or Dallas and then flown home. Um, so it was, we, it was the last flight. So first day of the four day, uh, I get a call that everyone E6 and above in the brigade has to be in the brigade amphitheater or theater or whatever the fuck it was, the post theater. No exceptions in uniform. You know, you, you know, it's not great when you get a, uh, a memo comes down that says, let me talk to all the NCOs real yes, quick. Like, so oh, everyone. Fuck. So, so yeah, E6s, <laughs> E7s, or maybe it was E7 and above. I can't remember, but, but obviously you know, being at the time, first Lieutenant, that counts as, you know, whatever and above. Um, and so we all show up and basically there had been like, <laughs> there'd been like 12 DUIs since we had, since the brigade had gotten home and a soldier had died and they blamed it on alcohol, but it turned out that he just had like a heart condition. Um, so the brigade commander basically, uh, decided to go full psycho. Um, and he, I mean, he was, he was, he was insane and he, he, he just completely lost his mind and talked about like, I don't need to hear you dis disloyal fucks, you know, bad mouthing your command behind their backs and stuff. <laughs> basically he decided we were doing weekend formations, Saturday and Sunday formations. He was declaring it like a health hazard or like a safety hazard. And so like we were going to be doing weekend formations, um, you know, 6 a.m., Saturday, 6 a.m. Sunday, full accountability, breathalyzers of everyone under 21 to stop this problem with DUIs. He was assigning all the officers in the brigade had to and, and senior NCOs had to go to uh, working groups to determine a plan to reduce DUIs to create named area of interests in named areas of interest in Anchorage, where we would then set up reconnaissance to do like courtesy patrol and, uh, you know, free Ooh. rides home and like, you know, all these things. And and I mean, it didn't last very long. But uh, it lasts that one weekend, and then um, they, by the time by Monday, they had enough congressional inquiries that they had to stop yeah. it. <laughs> but it was very funny because I stepped out of that, and I was just in a daze. And I called my dad, and I was like, you are not going to believe what just happened. And I explained it to him, and he, he was like, man, that sounds like some shit they would have pulled at Camp Casey in Korea when I was there. And then years later, guess where I got fucking sent? And do you know why I got sent <laughs> yeah. to Casey? Because my dad found out I was going to Korea and called a friend of his who was still working for Second ID and was like, hey, my son's going to go to Korea. Like, it would be great if he could be in 2-9 also, which is like the worst unit in Korea. <laughs> so your dad I got manchewed you. by my fucking dad. If you were ever in 2-9 <laughs> Manchus, you know exactly what I'm talking about getting manchewed means. I got manchewed by my own fucking dad. That's that's great that your dad is just like yeah you tell it like, oh, this is fucked up. And your dad's like, yeah, that's uh, that's exactly uh what I experienced, and since you've experienced this, since you already have a background in it, why don't you go to Camp Casey too? I'm really glad that my father was just like a Missouri National Guard guy for like four years and then <laughs> fucked off from the army. But for it's the rest also it's like so because like to... anyone who's been in Korea knows that if you have the choice between a place like even Weejungbu, but like if you have a choice between uh, Yongsan in Seoul or Casey in Tongdushan, like bro, Yongsan is one of the nicest places you can be stationed. Red Cloud and Weejung is okay. It's kind of a grim post, but Weejung is pretty Weejung is a pretty cool city by and large. But Donuchon is awful and Casey is awful. And like it's hard for a infantry captain with without having been a commander yet to get a job at at, uh, at you know Eighth Army and Yongsan. But I definitely was trying for it. And instead I got fucking man shoot by my dad. I got set to fucking two nine. I'll just you know, <laughs> the great crippler of soldiers. They do like a twice yearly 25 mile road march through the mountains. Ugh. Like, oh, it sucked so bad. It was my fucking dad. And then I flash back to like me calling my dad in Alaska and being like, God, this sucks. He's like, yeah, that sucks really bad. That sounds like shit they pull in Korea. <laughs> oh, I don't miss the army. We, lo we love oh. it. We love it when our fathers fuck us over. I don't miss in the army. In, in a funny way. This is like therapy for me now. I don't miss the army at all. And if you ever wonder why <laughs> you know? I don't miss the army at all, like being an infantryman, like this is the kind of shit that just becomes your normal. And like you can't have a weekend because someone in another company fucking, you know, fucked a dog. And now everyone's got to have like a 9 a.m. formation for like mandatory training on how to not fuck dogs. Like, I swear to God, it's like you are you, you are treated like like unruly middle school children in some kind of like diversion program that's court ordered when you're in your forties. Like it's, 
Ugh, yeah, can't stand it. Yeah. Well, anyway, everybody, thank you for listening. Uh, what do we have for the bonus? Dad this chat week? where I have a concussion. Dad chat. Yeah, dad chat where Nate talks about uh, how his brain has been caved in once again, but this time not by the army. This time by his own fault. Through my civilian, through my regular job, I have very good insurance, and it is like I know that when I put that down and then it gets run, that there is a you know you see the little dollar signs kind of pop up behind yeah. somebody's fucking eyes because they're just like and and you know because it's not going to hit me it's going to hit my insurance and like it's just the same as uh you know the the cost of of tuition for college it's like what this is doing is i mean tuition obviously hits the person who who's taking out the loan but like it's one of those it's just you know it's commodified like you said housing is commodified like just your health is and knowing that everybody knowing that you know that's how you're seen but also that that's just the that's the way that it works because if the doctor doesn't do these things and the doctor doesn't make any money either it's like everybody has to run through these insurance companies to make any fucking money it's like you know i could just give you you know money directly through taxes or something like just it's it, it is it is incredible like americans are so like i don't know black pilled red pill i don't know what pill we all fucking took that made us say that um everybody getting health care is impossible but we do have like we have this like unfortunate like rugged individualism thing which was completely made up um not none of it is real and it all stems from those little house in the fucking prairie books too because um laura ingles wilder's daughter was an insane libertarian um, and and use those books to be like, look, you can be a rugged uh, individualist and make it in make it in this world. You don't need other people. Like completely ignoring the fact that like they would have died multiple times if it hadn't been for you know communalism out on the fucking prairies and stuff. So I don't know. It's uh, l- listening to you talk about this and like knowing that there's just people out there who can't get the most basic shit. Because you know there's a because there's a, like healthcare is paywalled and it's really fucked up. So I just feel like I'm glad and, and I'm glad that, you know, we we could talk about these things because it is it is possible. A better world is possible um, as long as we don't let the British run it. But then again, you know, the better world being possible, we're letting the Americans run it. Like even if FDR had New Dealed his way into universal health care, Reagan would have fucking dismantled that shit years ago. Um like with a sledgehammer so i mean in in ways he did he did you know defund a lot of uh medical necessities and medical help for i don't know shareholders and for other white people who have a bunch of money all of a sudden so i'm glad i'm glad that uh you know your your tbi is um you know not it's not too traumatic hopefully uh you you sounded coherent this uh these last 30 minutes so i you know thumbs (laughs) up hopefully everything's good to go Uh, i can only imagine that a head injury is going to make you a more powerful podcaster so i mean it was it was pretty bad and i i'm not gonna lie man i'm feeling it back and forth here today even you know you go this morning i felt pretty good is able to get stuff done i periodically will feel like tired and dizzy and it sucks. I mean, but it, 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 it's not as severe as the one I had about, you know, two and some change years ago. And yeah, I realized, how did you manage that one? I don't remember oh that God, one. Oh, God, dude. So I was similar. I was almost home. And back in those days, we lived in an apartment in a big complex, uh, it was a, like a council estate. And there was a bus stop and like a, a sidewalk down the road that I'd come home on. And it was easier to just uh, buy the bus stop swing like on to where there's a dip in the curb like for like a ramp you know ramp up onto the curb and then ride on on the sidewalk a little bit and then cut through the parking lot and go right to my door where you know, the entryway was to our apartment and uh i do this all the time wasn't even thinking about it and one night in august in 2019 i was riding home and did that and i don't know what happened I think one of two things, but I can't really remember. Either my front tire jammed in a divot in the pavement and it caused me to it either stop the, the wheel or it, it caused my foot to slip or my foot just slipped on its own and stopped the wheel. But I jammed up, not going that fast, and it caused me to fall over the bike onto the bike, but basically turn over, like 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 roll over while I was falling. And I landed... Uh, you know, ass head, ass back head, basically. But really, I landed just hit the back of my head. I was wearing a helmet, 
harder than fuck against the pavement. And I blacked out for a second. Um, I blacked out for a second, just and then woke up seeing stars. I was more worried about my my bruises and stuff because I had you know landed on my bike, immediately formed bruises like fast as shit, cut myself a little bit, and I was like, fuck, like this is this is I'm gonna be it's gonna be hard to walk, but my head's okay. I just banged my head. And I came in, I drank water, you know, I I took a bath with the, Epsom salt. The army. Yeah, the army things to take a Motrin, D- drink some water, change it. your Did, socks. Didn't even think of it. I woke up the next morning and I felt like I had drank 10 pints on an empty stomach. I felt like I had the worst hangover I'd ever had in my life. And I wasn't, I hadn't had any, any alcohol. I was so fucked up from that shit. And I realize now, like, from having talked to the doctor and gone through, like, the different stages of it, that this one that I had the other night wasn't that severe. I didn't black out. My symptoms were relatively minor. You know, like I said, ringing in the ears, nausea, dizziness, confusion, but it wasn't that severe. It just, you know, it was worth getting checked out. And I'm glad I went anyway because I found out my wrist is sprained and I have this brace, which at least helps it from getting worse. But I sh- absolutely should have fucking gone uh, back then. And if I had gone... And I'd gotten it checked out and maybe gotten, you know, whatever treatment. I know there's some stuff they can do and there's some medicine they can give you. I might not have had basically months of post-concussion syndrome because I was fatigued and tired and irritable and, and just like brain fogged for fucking months. I mean, Milo even said there was something we had to do in like in and around November 2019. And he was like, dude, this is the first time since your bike accident you've seemed like yourself. Like it fucked me up for a while, and uh, yeah, once again, almost I didn't even like, notice during our oh, podcast. Bro, we recorded one, and you, you absolutely would have noticed because I recorded the morning after with you, and I was so I was so brain. Like, you can listen to that recording, and I'm it's like I'm talking on fucking half speed. Like it was bad. I remember this August 2019. So that that recording would have been like the beginning of September 2019 is when it would have come out. I was, yeah, man, it 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 it, it, it fucked me up pretty bad. And, um, this one, like I said, I'm old now, or I'm yeah, old, old, but I'm 37. I've had a bunch of concussions, uh, from the military and from, you know, like from being a paratrooper, I got one when I was 14. That was actually pretty severe. I, I, uh, was practicing for like some class where we had to do some sort of acting school play thing. And I tripped on someone's backpack and fell backwards and hit my head against the, the back of my head against a brick wall. And like, that was a concussion where like, I felt sleepy and then started throwing up and shit. Like that was actually pretty serious. Um, and then, yeah, bad landings when I was a paratrooper and then this shit and like concussions are kind of cumulative and you just have to, you know, know how to take care of it. I just, I'm just grateful. I don't fucking have to deal with health insurance and money and co-pays and all that. Like, and like, don't get me wrong. I'm going to be honest with you. Like, yeah, there are problems you deal with, with the NHS. I'm always wary of talking about those problems because I realize how much better it is to at least have it as a fail safe compared to America because America sucks so much about this and for no reason. But the thing that I will say is that I understand why rich people go to America for healthcare because you can get really good healthcare if you can pay for it. But the fact that the, that exists in a system where it can exist because we bankrupt and kill people is completely immoral. And I, I, I hate that shit. I'm really grateful I have it here. I don't think it's going to last forever here. And in the current political climate, if they didn't have it, there is no way in hell they would create it. Oh, no. And I think in in my lifetime, you will see them go to uh, an insurance-based, fee-based model. Uh, Or at least what they'll do is it'll still be the NHS, but everything will be privately run and the government will be billed like American billing, even if like the services are being provided, you know, through call it health insurance under the ages of you being a British citizen and the NHS being your health insurance. But then they will start denying people care. And they're already doing that, taking stuff off the NHS and making it go private and letting people buy their way to the front of the queue. Like that's already happening. So it's very, very sad. And I think I've talked about this before, but if you want like, you know, the the quandary of healthcare versus imperialism writ large, uh, in Britain, the NHS came into being in 1948. When it came into being, uh, it covered everything to include optical and dental. Really amazing, beautiful thing. And the teeth removals and fixing teeth and also getting glasses were some of the biggest things. There was so much built up demand when they first started. There were so many people who needed glasses and needed their teeth fixed. 
but couldn't afford it because of the way the system was before. But then in 1951, uh, the British government decided to join the UN force and send troops to the Korean War. And part of the sort of budgetary debates about how to pay for that military deployment, they decided to make it so you had to pay for dental care and optical. So you had completely comprehensive social democracy healthcare system that covered, you know, getting glasses and covered getting your teeth fixed for free for three years. And then they cut it. And then obviously under Thatcher, they started privatizing it. And then Blair came in and was like, all right, I have the biggest labor majority in history. Time to keep cutting it. And that's why we're at where we're at today. So it fucking sucks, man. It's awful. I wish it was, I wish it was different. All right, everybody. Uh, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, Remember, you can follow me at Army Strength, follow Nate in these de- at In These Deserts, and follow the podcast at Hell of a Way. And you can always uh, hear more of that six years of bonus content going back uh, $5 a month to get access to all of that, $10 a month to get a, uh, a care package. And the care package should be going out uh, at the end of February. So get them $10 things in. You'll, I'll get your address, and I'll send you out some free stickers and patches and whatnot. And that happens every quarter. So jump in on that. Uh, go for it. Uh, But other than that, everybody, thank you for listening. And Nate, we'll talk to you next week. Yep, take care.